I just wanted to ask you what drew you to this story? Was it a personal experience or, you know, what was it about the underlying story here that made you want to make your first non-documentary? Uh, well, all three of those stories seem like interesting documentary. They could be interesting documentaries, and all three of those things are based on things that are happening every day. Um, I'm sorry you were freaked out. I, I'm, I hope I love hearing when people say, oh, it makes me want to reach out and tell someone that I you know, miss them or love them. You know, like when you have a dream, a bad dream, and you wake up and you suddenly inexplicably want to call your mother or sister, or you know, and, and they find it strange that you're calling. Um, I like that. I like that effect. Um, but no, it uh, does. I mean, it does have that effect, but it just makes me wonder. And I'm looking at a, at least one other person I know who's a parent here in the audience of, you know, all the times we spend in our house, everybody on their own device, um, and it really does resonate in that way. Yeah, I mean, I don't think being on advice is bad. I think it can just, like, we have two parallel realities now. We used to have just one, the physical world, and now there's another one. And I think that other one is very exciting. You just, uh, we're all dealing with how much should we, you know, be in that other one. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, I don't think there were a thousand people you could talk to in a second. You couldn't. You had to just sort of hang out with the person in front of you. Now that you have the choice of a thousand other people, if that more, who can I talk to? I could talk to anyone right now. It's, it's, it's sort of tough to you know, make those decisions every minute of every day. Where do you put your focus? So I think it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's an exciting challenge. And right? did you help work on the script, or how is it, and do research for it, and how did you develop these storylines? So the story, uh, the stories were sort of inspired from uh, real live events uh, by Andrew Stern, and uh, he, um, you know, fictionalized them, and uh, then m me not knowing how to make a fiction movie really, um, I just set about it like I would a documentary. So I interviewed a lot of people that went through all these things. I went through, I interviewed people who had gotten their identity stolen, and I interviewed people you know, who had uh, worked on pornographic chat sites. And I interviewed people who were uh, cyber bullies, uh, one kid actually only. And I, um, I interviewed FBI agents and uh, cyber crimes detective from New York City. And I put all these people in front of my actors in case they wanted to, you know, spend time with them. Um, and yeah, that was very useful. And once I really understood you know, when, what these people went through, then we would go and rewrite certain scenes in the script to make them re reflect reality better. Um, so it was a sort of retroactive documentary research that fed back into the storylines. Um, that's how we did it. And then how did you, I mean, what fantastic group of actors you were able to cast in the film? How did you go about getting word out about this film and, and finding these people to bring the characters to life? Uh, well, the the financier uh, is an unusually, you know, um, risky guy. He just said to me and the producer, just hire whoever you think is good. That's, so we just went after people I know that we liked. The guy had always loved Michael Nyquist, who's a small role, but he plays the guy in a girl with the dragon tattoo. You know that in the Swedish film. I love him. You know he plays the journalist. So I was, I was like. Let's put him in the movie somewhere. And I've always loved Jason Bateman. I always thought he was a very magnetic guy who you can really relate to, and I've never really seen him do drama. He's, and you know, when I asked him, he said, thank you. No one asks me to do drama ever. I wish people would. Um, so he, yeah. And so I had him grow a beard so that you wouldn't notice he was funny. I was hoping that would help you believe that it's someone else, you know, not the guy from Arrested Development. Uh, and then other odd casting choices, Mark Jacobs. I was going to ask about that. How did you convince him to make his film debut, particularly in a role like that? Yeah, he doesn't really care what anybody thinks. So, <laughs> so he was—he just was up for it. He thought it was f a funny a challenge. You know, he's a very brilliant, creative mind, and always looking for a challenge. And I've known him for years. And I actually had a friend who was supposed to play this role, the guy who um, owns the box. I'm sure you've all heard of the box. Um, down on Christie Street. His name is Simon Hammerstein. And he he seemed like a, a, a good fit. <laughs> and then his wife told him he wasn't allowed to play that role. 
So I was I was just racking my brain for a few weeks, and I came up with mm, maybe Mark Mark Jacobs would like to play that guy. Sort of bizarre thought. It just crossed my brain, and he said yes. Um, yeah. So um, the internet is sort of a source of deception or a facilitator of deception seems to be a big theme, kind of the distance that it allows people to to deceive others and to be something that they're actually not in real life or to project an alternate self. I mean, do you think that's different from other forms of deception? Is it just more faster or is it what is it about the web and technology, given that you said this you didn't consider this an anti-technology? film yeah the, i mean the the themes of deception and identity and false identity are definitely strong in this piece of writing that a andrew uh did but i i also see other things that are interesting that are not necessarily negative i love the scene where jason bateman is connecting to that kid and they're actually both telling each other the truth for the first time in the movie they're being honest with each other um I, and uh Though by though he thinks he's speaking to a girl, um, so I think that's a giant truth of the internet too. Is it can really can connect you with other people, like-minded people, or people who are, are are going through what you're going through. I think it's incredibly therapeutic and helpful. And in that one scene, it is for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm. I, you know, it's funny. You make a movie, and you have no idea. Really, there's a lot of things going on in the film, and I'm hoping that they're. Uh, you know, that it's also about people communicating and miscommunicating and the power of human relationships at the end of the film. And that you don't come away just thinking, okay, well, that's the anti-technology film. But if people walk away thinking then that I have no control over that, you know. But certainly to make a movie a thriller, to make it a dramatic thriller, we got to pull some stories out of the out of the world that are happening right now that are dramatic and, and have, you know, to do with deception or... Um, you know, in the case of the the journalist mm -hmm. and the and the um, and the, and the kid, I think that was more that theme was more about exploitation. You know, mm -hmm. I could relate to that. Being a documentarian, you're always wondering whether or not you're doing the right thing right. by b shooting someone, putting them on on camera. You know, to me, that was less about the internet, really, and uh, they just happened to meet that way. Yeah. I see we have a question. Uh, we have one question here. Go ahead. Thank you for sharing the film. That was uh, really powerful. I thought it was great. Uh, just a question about you personally. On the spectrum of being connected versus not to get like, not connected, or like how digital are you personally? Are you always connected with multiple devices, or are you, a, I don't even own a smartphone type of person? Yeah. I, st I like all of you in this room, struggle with how much time I spend on my phone. And um, I'm sure that's true down to every last one of you. Um, and my friends, it's the same, same question, you know. Uh, like I said when I sat down, how, how, like who do you focus on, the person in front of you or the 10 people texting you? It's such a hard decision, <laughs> especially when you love three of those 10 people texting you and one of them's your mother and you really <laughs> have to get back to your mother, you know. But yet you're sitting with your father and he's saying, stop. Get off your phone. You know these are the questions everyone's asking themselves every day. I don't think I'm alone. Um, no, I was not. I was not on Facebook for a long time. I am now. Uh, I, I I am now. Yeah, and uh, I only have a hundred friends, which people laugh at me, but they're people I know. Um, I am on Instagram, and I love Instagram. That's a lot of fun to just check out where everybody is and what they're doing. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. Go over here. So I agree with both of you how the internet can be a vehicle for dishonesty in new ways and honesty as well, as, as illustrated so well in that scene. And I'm just curious for you personally, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where th these technologies will take us in terms of human relations? I've, I'm incredibly optimistic. I, I probably shouldn't be. I should be like the guy who's saying, get off your your phone, because I made this movie. But again, I didn't make this movie because of a message that some people think it has. I made this movie because it felt very real. All, a lot of the questions and things in it felt very real to me, and like things that I'm struggling with myself. Um, I'm very, very optimistic. I'm very excited about Google Glass. I think for a filmmaker, that is like a radical thing. 
you know? Is that what it's called, Google Glass? Yeah. That's like something like I could put on glasses and I, I've, I've waited my whole life as a filmmaker for, for glasses I could put on and film everything. You know, I've always wanted a camera in my eyeball. But the things that are so hard to get on, on film uh, are those intimate moments between people where someone's embarrassed or someone's showing emotion or someone's in danger. That's when you put your camera down as a filmmaker. You feel as a human, you're like, I can't possibly film this. Someone's dying or someone is crying, or someone's just had something horrible happen, and we put the camera down. If I had had a camera in my eyeball, I would have more, even more beautiful scenes in the, the film Murderball, you know? Uh, be, it would be more intimacy. So I'm excited for all those moments that are going to be captured in the future by filmmakers, you know, using that technology. Thank you. Do we have someone else here? Hi. Um, I was curious in the past how you've approached like the the documentary subjects that you've made, and then how this experience of making a narrative you think will affect future movies, whether those are narratives or documentaries. Personally, for me. Yes, like uh, if there, you know, how you use the documentary approach in this narrative. If there's things that you learned about the narrative that you would bring back if you're making a documentary. Um, it's funny you say that because w- when my partner Dana and I were making Murder Ball, we, uh, we watched a lot of sports films that we love, movies like Rudy and Hoosiers and Rocky and Miracle, and we were determined to make a movie with Murder Ball that would feel like a fiction movie that would suck you in and had music and had shots and had sequences so that it wouldn't feel like your typical documentary that was just zooming in on everything from, a f- you know, and uh, and so... But but now I did the exact opposite with this film. Is uh, you know everything was just in front of me. So and 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 you, usually when you're shooting a documentary, it's always a struggle to just get someone's face in focus. And so I found myself getting annoyed with all the control that I had. And uh, I would start. Sh- I started shooting from across the street or shooting through people. And it's then it felt more real to me. It felt more like what I'm used to seeing through the lens. You know. Um, but there are a lot of rules on set that I learned that are very annoying. Like, you're supposed to say cut. I, you don't say cut in documentaries, okay? <laughs> you, you would never say that. So I just ended up just letting the camera roll a lot. And what that w- was wonderful about that is that it kept the makeup artists and the hair people and the booming people, you know, with the mics and the guys tweaking the lights, it kept them away. Because they, when you're rolling, they don't want ever want to be in the frame. So they just stay at bay, and then I could play, and the uh, the the actors could do whatever and go wherever they wanted. And I, I shot most of this movie with two cameras, which means they could interrupt each other or they could play the scene this way or that way. You could always cut it together, um, and that was uh, the way that I took back control over the set because you know the me- the machinery of movie making is really heavy. There's cables everywhere, as I'm sure you guys have seen. Everything's contrived. There's nothing real about the process. So uh, what I would do, especially with the kids, is I would move the cameras back far. And sometimes I would even put a light, like there's a light in my face now, I would hit a light towards them so they couldn't even see where the cameras were. I did that quite a lot. And then they would forget that the cameras were even filming them. And I would just say, go again, go again, go again. And by the fifth or sixth take, they were just acting like you know, themselves, you know, clowns. And then I got good footage, you know? And how much of it was, I mean, letting them, sticking to the script and doing variations on that, or is it, you know, like Woody Allen, you know, here, here's a general thing of where we're going in this scene and some thing, points we want to hit, but leaving it up to the actors to interpret their characters in the situation. Well, we started with the script, and then we got further away from the script, and then we would just, I would just tell them to do it in their words. Sometimes... For certain scenes that were mo- that required more emotion, where you didn't, where I just wanted to see what they would come up with, um, you know, I just really, uh, you know, it, most directors, the idea of directing is like very aggressively dominating and imposing your will or viewpoint on people, and I, because I come from documentaries, thought of my actor, th- thought my actors, well, they're real people, they have instincts. Let's see what they do before I even influence them in any direction. Let's just see what their instincts are. And that's how I operated. Um, And then if there were things that I felt were fake or needed correcting, 
then I would step in. But I never spoke before a scene because I just, you know, these are humans and these stories are human and let's see what they come up with. Let's see how they play it, you know? So in fact, if anything, I was found myself allowing the actors to be more than uh, telling them what to do. If that makes sense. I just want to switch gears a bit because I'm in looking at your bio and in talking um, with you a bit before we did the screening. Um, we're an advertising company, which is, you know, people don't realize that Google is and, and looking at your resume and the things you've done. I mean, how do you go from making a film like this or serious documentaries that are so intense to doing Burger King? Advertising is really fun and I love it and I do it every day. It's my day job. And uh, I really love trying to make real things look beautiful um, or, or make beautiful things look more real. Um, that's, that's a lot of the challenge because so much of advertising is so contrived. And as you all know, nobody wants to sit through advertising. So we're all finding, trying to figure out ways to not watch or not listen to advertising. So how do you get into that 1% of ads that cut through? Um, I think the Google Glass thing cut through. Um, it became more than just an ad. It became like news. Um, that's exciting, ads like that. you know. And I've been involved in a lot of campaigns like that that it felt like uh, social experiments, like I did Whopper Freak Out, where we took the Whopper off the menu and we filmed people freaking out. Um, that was one of the, the ads I did. Or I just did this Coca-Cola campaign where we went around the world and we really found real people who do good. Um, and so there's a guy, you know, uh, who puts up swings in poor neighborhoods all over. And it just transforms the neighborhood. And that's what he does. He's committed his life to that. Um, and there's another girl who plants trees, you know, in, in, in crap neighborhoods uh, that are very industrial. And there's another guy who uh, made it, uh, got rich off an insurance company that he sold. So he gives a thousand pounds to a stranger every day. And he's been doing it systematically for now over a year. Um, you know, uh, and so we found these people and I got to interview them and hang out with them. And it was just, it was just, you know, it wasn't about... Of, uh, obviously, it's about selling sweet water in the end, but it was sort of a great experience to uh, put all these people who do cool stuff um, up on screen, you know? Um, those are the kinds of ads I love, you know? Cool. Brendan? Hi. Um, like, to your point you just mentioned, your, your, your visual style has a very kind of cinema verite approach. Do you think that if you, going forward with any future non-documentary features you make, or even a documentary, do you think that you're sort of stuck in your ways now. You found a great niche, and you know exactly what you know. A, a Ruben movie is going to look like this. Um, I love that a Ruben movie. That, that suggests that I'm going to make another one. <laughs> um, yes, I mean I reverted to tell you the truth on being on set. If I'm to be really honest, it was you know I had no idea what I was doing at first. I'm just I'm I'm very comfortable with documentaries and the the politics of fiction film and the, the hierarchy of the crew and all that is, is, can be very uh, daunting and off-putting. And everything is so uh, contrived in that atmosphere of a set that getting to a place, a safe place where you can allow actors to feel safe and be real is a huge challenge. It's much easier to do it in a documentary form because people are just living in their world and you're just sneaking around, zooming in on them, you know? I prefer that. I, I, I reverted to that, making this movie, uh, to that way of being. So yes, I think I have a way that I feel comfortable shooting things, and I'll, I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> so we won't be seeing you make Iron Man 4 or... No? I don't think so. I don't think I would do well making a movie like that. I think it would look really strange and, and you know, eavesdropped, you know? I, I think, I'm not sure it would, it would look good. I don't know. Um, I, plus, I, I think those movies are fun, but they're not what I'm interested in. I love the idea, of, you know, whether it's a documentary or, or an ad that's 60 seconds or, or a fiction movie. I'm really, what's the most exciting thing for a filmmaker for me is, is emotion. And if you can get that, if you can create that in 60 or 90 seconds, and you know, you can create that at, at the end of a fiction movie, then that's exciting. That's the stuff that sort of gets under your skin. That's the stuff that you think about two days from now, you know, all that other stuff is noise. There's so much noise out there, you know? I think it's, for me, at least in my experience, it's when I feel something that I remember it, you know? 
So do you have a next project that you're starting in the middle of? I mean, how does that the process work for you? This is now out and getting a great reception. So how does what do you do next? Um, I'm about to go uh, to Spain where I'm going to paint a Volvo truck red, bright red, and then we're going to send it through Pamplona with the bulls chasing it. And it's a, <laughs> and we'll see if this driver can handle all the turns on the bull run. Um, that, and we're going to do it for real. So that'll be fun. So I'm leaving tomorrow to shoot that. We want to thank you again for coming and sharing your film with us on thank a you. Friday afternoon. Thanks for staying, guys. And good luck with the Volvo. Thank you.